Hey guys, I'm Sebastian. I'm Sam. And welcome to the fourth annual Central Florida Brain Bee. Uh, before we get started on our first lesson, we're going to tell you a little bit about what the Brain Bee is like. So throughout this school year, you guys are going to be learning about the central nervous system in entirety via the Brain Facts book, as well as the PowerPoints that we prepared for you guys. At the end, you and your school are going to head to UCF to compete against other schools in the area. So you're going to be tested via three phases of questions. The first question is going to be a written exam. The second phase is going to be a uh, clinically oriented lab practical style. And then the third phase is going to be an oral presentation for the top competitors. At the end, we're going to see which school and which student knows the most about the central nervous system. All right, guys, so before we dive into the basic anatomy of the brain, I do want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the different cells that make up our nervous system, OK? So in this big pink blob, we have a bunch of neurons. We have a bunch of glial cells, which are the supportive cells of the nervous system. And we have two distinct areas that make up this nervous system. This is the gray matter as well as the white matter. Okay, the gray matter is going to be where the cell body of the neurons lie, um, surrounded by neural glia. The white matter is, all, is going to be the nerve axons or the nerve fibers surrounded by neural glia. Okay, that's going to be uh, really important the later we go on. Okay. Now there are a couple of basic lobes of the brain. This is going to be the frontal lobe because it's in the front part of your skull or the front anterior part of your body. Okay. As we move further back, this is going to be the parietal lobe. Okay. The furthest lobe back in the posterior section is going to be the occipital lobe. And then this lobe that is distinctly separated by this line is going to be the temporal lobe. Okay. Now, as we go on, I'm going to be using a couple of uh, very specific words that mean a lot of really important things in the nervous system. So we're going to talk about a sulcus, a fissure, and a gyrus. Okay. A sulcus is a very thin groove. For example, this is a sulcus. Okay. A gyrus is kind of the meaty pink material here, as you see. So this gyrus is sandwiched in between these two sulci. Okay. Now, a sulcus <clears throat> is a thin groove, whereas a fissure is a much deeper groove. So for example, this here would be a much deeper groove, so this is a fissure. This groove here is a very deep groove, and this is also a fissure. Okay? So we have a left and a right hemisphere, and both of these hemispheres of the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex are separated by that line. See how we can take it apart? That line is called the longitudinal fissure. Okay, so that's a really important landmark that you guys should know, the longitudinal fissure. Now, just like that fissure, there is a fissure here that I mentioned earlier that separates the temporal lobe, the temporal lobe, from the parietal and frontal lobes. This is your lateral sulcus or your sylvian fissure. Okay, so I would know both of those names, the sylvian fissure and it is also called the lateral sulcus. So within the lateral sulcus or the sylvian fissure, there is more gray matter, there's more cerebral cortex, and that's called the insula. Um, so you'll see an image of that on the, on the screen right now. So that insula continues all the way down. Basically, it's an inner folding of the cortex, and therefore, if you were to pry this open uh, with some forceps, you would see more of this pink gyrus material in there, okay? So that's why it has two names. Now, let's get into some of the basic functions as well as some of the basic sulci and gyri on this model. So the frontal lobe is generally associated with uh, creative thinking, higher level judgment, and things like that. This is one of the last places of your brain to develop. So further in your development, this is the last place to actually fully develop. Um, your parietal lobe uh, has a lot to do with somatosensory stuff, so basically sensory information that comes into your body. Um, the occipital lobe uh, has a large deal to do with vision and the, the optic pathway. Okay, so visual association areas are here. The temporal lobe is largely uh, closely associated with hearing as well as memory further uh, deep you go. Okay, so uh, look into your BrainFax book to see some of the more uh, main functions of those lobes. Okay, so getting started, I'm going to turn this around so we can see some of these numbers. On the frontal lobe, we have a couple of distinct gyri that you can see here. Okay. So in anatomy, we have a couple of words that we use to describe specific regions, okay? And usually those regions are relative to whatever else we are looking at. So for example, we're gonna use the word superior here because it's the top most gyrus, inferior over here because it's the bottom most gyrus of this lobe, and middle here because it's sandwiched in between these two gyri, 
okay? So we are on the frontal lobe, and this is the superior gyrus of the frontal lobe, so we are just simply going to call it the superior frontal gyrus. Similarly, because we already mentioned this was the middle gyrus here, this is the middle frontal gyrus. And then at the bottom, this would be the inferior frontal gyrus. Now each gyri is going to be separated from the next gyri or gyrus via this sulcus or via a sulcus. So here we have a sulcus that separates this gyrus from this gyrus, and we have this sulcus which separates this gyrus from this gyrus. So because we only have two, we're not gonna have a middle one, we're just gonna have a top and bottom. So this is the superior frontal gyrus, or sulcus, excuse me, and this is the inferior frontal sulcus. Okay, so superior frontal sulcus, inferior frontal sulcus. Okay, now <clears throat> a little bit more, moving more posteriorly. This is still the frontal lobe, okay? This sulcus is a little bit different than the other ones. So this one's running a little bit more longitudinally, not as uh, transversely. So this is the precentral sulcus, and I'll get to why that's important in just a little bit. So this is the precentral sulcus. Immediately after the precentral sulcus, as we move more towards the posterior portion of the brain, this immediate gyrus is called the precentral gyrus. And this runs nice and easy up and down. So it's very distinct from these that run transversely. Okay? So this precentral gyrus is going to be very important for us because this is your primary motor cortex. Primary motor cortex. It's also going to be Broadman Area 4, and we'll get to what that is later on in these lectures, okay? But I would have the, both of those memorized, pre-central gyrus as well as the primary motor cortex. Now, separating this gyrus, which we just named the pre-central gyrus, and this gyrus is this really deep sulcus. Okay, this isn't a fissure, but it is a very important landmark in the brain. It actually goes all the way from one side, and you can trace it all the way to the other side. This sulcus is called the central sulcus. And this central sulcus separates the frontal lobe, which is all of this, from the parietal lobe, which is all of this. Okay? So that central sulcus is going to separate this precentral gyrus, which is your primary motor cortex, from this gyrus, which we're going to call the postcentral gyrus. And this postcentral gyrus is also your primary somatosensory cortex. So the word soma, meaning body, and sensory, meaning sensory information. This is the area, uh, this cort piece of cortex that's going to interpret certain things that you're feeling, like textures, for example, like the difference between wood and a furry dog or a carpet, okay? Now, after the post-central gyrus, the last sulcus that you guys should know here is the post-central sulcus. So it goes nice and easy and in order. So in order, we have the pre-central sulcus, the precentral gyrus, the central sulcus, the postcentral gyrus, and then the postcentral sulcus. Okay? <clears throat> if that's a little difficult to remember the first time around, go ahead and get some practice in, okay? It's just gonna take a little bit of practice to get that into memory. Now let's go down to the temporal lobe and talk about the exact same thing that we just did in the frontal lobe. So here we already named this sulcus or fissure, so go ahead and test yourselves and see if you remember the name of this specific structure. But on the temporal lobe, just immediately inferior to that, we have three distinct gyri and two distinct sulci. So the superior sulcus here, we're going to name specifically on the temporal lobe, is your superior temporal gyrus. The one on the bottom is just your inferior temporal gyrus, and the one in the middle would be your middle temporal gyrus. And just like we had in the frontal lobe, this sulcus that sandwich is sandwiched in between this gyrus and this gyrus is just going to be called your superior temporal sulcus. And the sulcus that is uh, separated between the inferior and middle temporal gyrus is going to, or gyri, is going to be called your inferior temporal sulcus. So just like the frontal lobe, we can see the same thing here on the temporal lobe. So I would make sure that I would have those memorized. Okay, and then back here again is the occipital lobe, which is mostly responsible for vision and visual association. Now, as we go more inferiorly towards the brainstem, we see this really stiff brown piece here. This is the cerebellum. Okay, many of you may have learned that the cerebellum's main function is about balance. So cerebellum, like a bell, like balancing a bell on your head. Um, that's the way that I originally learned it. 
The cerebellum has a lot of functions, but its main function is to smooth out motor movement, okay? So issues with the, with the cerebellum is going to lead to something called ataxia, and we'll get to what that is later. Now, for as the anatomical portion here, this line or fissure that separates the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex from the cerebellum is called the transverse fissure. Transverse fissure. So that goes all the way from here through there. So the line that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum is the transverse fissure. Okay. Now, please don't get that confused with the horizontal fissure because the horizontal fissure is this line. This line, seen on both sides, is going to separate the anterior from the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. So this is the anterior lobe of the cerebellum. This would be the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. And this would be the flocculus, which leads into a lobe that we're going to call the flocculonodular lobe. I like to call it the waka flocka lobe to help me memorize but the real name for this is the flocculonodular lobe, okay? So anterior, posterior, flocculonodular. This line right here was the what? This line right here was called what? Let's kind of dive in uh, to the, the fun stuff in the middle, okay? So we're gonna cut through this fissure, which was called what? Hopefully you guys remember. So I'm going to split this open, boing, and then we're going to get to this view of the brain, okay? So for now, we're not going to talk about the rest of this because these are just going to help make up some of those lobes that we talked about, but we're going to dive in deeper into the more specific regions. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Perfect. Okay. So many of you might recognize this white band that's going across from the anterior to the posterior part of the brain. This is called the corpus callosum, okay? So the corpus callosum is a commissural fiber that is going to help bridge the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. If you damage this, or in the case of someone who may have been born with epilepsy and, and has a lot of seizures, this may have been cut via a surgery, that person's going to have a couple of really interesting uh, symptoms, and that's called split brain syndrome. So I would look into that as well. But what you guys need to know is that this big white band is known as the corpus callosum, and it's going to bridge the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere and allow for communication, okay? Now, just anterior, this would be the front of the brain, this would be the posterior side, because we can see the cerebellum. The anterior portion, just inferior to that corpus callosum, is a wall of tissue called the septum pellucidum, okay, septum pellucidum. Just behind the septum pellucidum, we have this kind of raised portion, and that's called the fornix. And right behind the fornix is a really important structure. This is the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus. This choroid plexus is uh, within all of the ventricles of the brain, which we'll get into what that is later. And this is going to give off CSF. Okay, so it's going to create and synthesize CSF. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so inside of your brain, there's a little bit of fluid and that fluid is going to help regulate a lot of things and also give a little bit of nutrition and protection. Okay, so we'll get into that much later. But the choroid plexus is super important to know. So this is that pink stuff. Okay. Now, underneath all of that, this big bulb, it's kind of not this big brown spot, but the thing around it, this is your thalamus. Okay, the thalamus is super important because it's basically the relay center for all sensory and motor inf information except for smell, okay? So all of the sensory information and all motor information is gonna pass through this thalamus before going up or going down, depending on which track you're in, um, all of which except for smell, okay? So this is really important. This brown piece that you might be asking about is called your interthalamic adhesion. Interthalamic adhesion. It's also called the intermediate mass, and it's just a little sticking point that connects this thalamus to the other thalamus on the other side, okay? So don't forget that you have a left and right here, and we're looking at a mid-sagittal cut of the brain. So interthalamic adhesion just means the adhesive portion in between the thalamus, or in between both of the left and right thalamus, okay? Now just above and behind that thalamus is the epithalamus, 
and just below the thalamus is the subthalamus. And even more below the subthalamus is this portion here, which is the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is super important for regulating endocrine function, things like that. Okay, so all of these structures have a lot of really important functions. Now, as we move more posteriorly, um, we get into this little bulb. Okay, so this bulb is your pineal body. Okay, your pineal body is going to help regulate your sleep and wake cycles. Okay, then we have these two points. You might see one on both sides. So the pineal body is the most posterior little bump here, but this bump we're going to call the posterior commissure. Posterior commissure. And commissure, again, just means fibers that connect the left and the right sides together. Now more to the front, this little bulb is the anterior commissure. So anterior meaning front, posterior meaning in the back. And then even more back from that would be, again, this pineal body. So don't forget that one. Don't get these two confused, okay? Now as we go down, as we descend inferiorly, we get into these two little bumps. So this kind of looks like a little mountain here. This top bump is called your superior colliculus. Superior colliculus. This is super important in the bilateral pupillary light reflex. So whenever you shine a light in someone's eye, their pupil should constrict and so should the one on the other side, even though you're only shining light on one side. If not, that means that there's a problem somewhere here, okay, or in some other portion of the optic pathway. Now, just below that is the inferior colliculus. The inferior colliculus has to do with auditory information, okay? Now, one really important aspect here is that right down the middle, this portion in totality is called the tectal plate. So all of this, the superior colliculus in this cross section and the inferior colliculus is called the tectal plate or the tectum, okay? Now, even more interesting than that, if you have all four, because this is only one on one side, one on the other side, if you had the other two, which are on the right side of the brain, and you had all four of them together, that would be called the corpora quadrigemina or the quadrigeminal plate. And corpora quadrigemina is a Latin word that uh, the root means four or two twins, two sets of twins or four twins. Um, so four little things that are equally alike. So corpora quadrigemina, like Gemini, okay? Now, over here, as we move inferiorly, this would be the pons, okay, the pons. It's not just this structure here that a lot of people think, it's this entire section of the brainstem. So this is the pons. And then down here would be the medulla oblongata. Okay, so pons and medulla. Pons, medulla, pons, medulla, pons, medulla. Okay, so don't forget that. And just posterior to that, we have a cross-section or a sagittal view of the cerebellum. So this is still your cerebellum, okay? What you're seeing here are the inner workings. So this kind of looks like a tree with a bunch of branches. And because of that, we call the base of the tree the arbor vitae. So the trunk of the tree is called arbor vitae, which translates into the tree of life. And then all of these branches are going to be called folia or foliae with an A-E at the end. Okay, so in the middle we have the arbor vitae, and then the branches are foliae. Alright guys, so I put both of the hemispheres of the brain back together, and we're going to talk about the cranial nerves. Now the cranial nerves are a specific set of nerves that come out from either the base of the brain or the brainstem itself. Uh, and they have very specific functions uh, uh, that we use every day and we take for granted. So we're going to talk about what they are, where they are locally on the brain, and whether or not they carry sensory information or motor information. So whether or not they affect your musculature or uh, interpret the external stimulus that you're receiving from your environment, okay? So cranial nerve number one, or Roman numeral one, is going to be your olfactory nerve. So this is going to be your olfactory nerve. Specifically, this is the bulb in the tract, but hopefully you guys just remember olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve is responsible for smell. Okay, so this is the nerve that helps you smell all the time. So this is going to be carrying sensory information because it's going to sense your, the smells of your external environment. Okay, a little fun fact about this is that these nerves actually die quite often because they're exposed to the real world and the outside. And so these nerves have to regenerate every two or three weeks. Okay. Now, after cranial nerve one, we have cranial nerve two, which is this nerve over here. So hopefully you guys can see that. This is the optic nerve, 
Okay, so the optic nerve is going to go into your eye, uh, and it's going to help uh, take that visual stimulus and send it all the way to the back of the brain in the occipital lobe to be interpreted. Okay, so this optic nerve has to do with the optic pathway. And one thing I'll mention about this is that right here there's a crossing, and this is called the optic chiasm. And this is where some of the nerves of this track actually cross. Now, as we move closer to cranial nerve 3, we kind of have to tilt the brain. Okay, so right here we have cerebral peduncles, and just coming off of that peduncle right there, that would be cranial nerve 3. Cranial nerve 3 is called your oculomotor nerve. Okay, oculomotor nerve. So in that name, you can already tell that that's going to have a motor function. So all of the, uh, almost all of the extra ocular eye muscles are innervated by this nerve, and so this is super important. If this nerve is damaged, the ability to move the eye up, down, left, and right is uh, somewhat inhibited, okay? So there are a couple muscles that are not uh, innervated by this nerve in the eye, but we're not gonna get into that today. So that is cranial nerve three, or the oculomotor nerve, which is a motor nerve. Now to get to four, we're just gonna move laterally. So this is cranial nerve four right here. Cranial nerve four is called the trochlear nerve, and this is going to be, again, a, a motor nerve, so it's not gonna carry any sensory information. So the trochlear nerve is actually going to come out from the posterior part of the brainstem. So the cerebellum is actually covering it right now, but it comes out of the back, okay? So that's kind of a unique thing about the trochlear nerve. And again, it's strictly motor. Now to get to cranial nerve 5, we're just going to move to the side again right here. This is cranial nerve 5. Cranial nerve 5 is the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is both sensory and motor. So it has both sensory applications and motor applications in your body. Okay, so the trigeminal nerve actually has three important branches. The first branch is going to be called your ophthalmic nerve. Okay, so the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. The second branch is going to be the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. And then the third branch that we care about is going to be called the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so that would be cranial nerve five. Now to get to cranial nerve six, we actually don't go to the side, we have to go back to the midline and get to cranial nerve six. So this is actually six. Over here we have seven and eight. But six coming out just underneath the pons, between the pons and the medulla, this is cranial nerve six, which is the abducens nerve. And this is again a strictly motor nerve. This is actually going to innervate the lateral rectus, which is a muscle on the outside of your eye. Okay, so this is going to help innervate those extra ocular eye muscles, just the lateral rectus though. So that is cranial nerve 6. To get to 7, we immediately go to the side. So the first one we see here is cranial nerve 7. Cranial nerve 7 is a big nerve that has a bunch of functions. So it's going to carry both sensory and motor information. So this is the facial nerve, meaning that it's going to innervate all of the facial expression muscles that you have. So this nerve helps you smile, it helps raise your eyebrows, and it helps you laugh and, and eat and chew and all that stuff. Maybe not necessarily chew, but open your mouth and smile and stuff, okay? Um, so that's cranial nerve seven. It also helps here because it innervates a muscle called the stapedius, and it helps innervate the sensory information of your tongue, so it helps you taste as well. So that is cranial nerve seven. As we move up, that is cranial nerve eight, just above it, so just superior to cranial nerve seven. And the eighth cranial nerve is your vestibulocochlear nerve. So your vestibulocochlear nerve has everything to do with your vestibular system, which is for balance and proprioception, and your cochlear aspect, or the cochlea, which has to do with hearing. Okay, so that is strictly a sensory nerve. It's going to help sense the external stimulus and help you balance yourself as well as interpret auditory stimuli. Okay, so that's cranial nerve eight. To get to cranial nerve nine, we just go straight down. So right there, we can see cranial nerve nine, okay? The cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve, and that is both motor and sensory, okay, glossopharyngeal nerve. This is going to help innervate some of the muscles in your pharynx, which is just behind your mouth, okay, and it also has some other sensory aspects to it. Underneath cranial nerve 9, we have the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. Cranial nerve 10 is going to be both motor and sensory, okay, so make sure you remember that. This one's really important throughout your digestive system. Okay, so it's going to innervate your esophagus as well as your stomach, and it does a lot. Okay, so this is your cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve. Now just below 10 is 11, and this all of this branch is going to be the accessory nerve. The accessory nerve is going to help innervate uh, 
a couple of really important muscles called the trapezius as well as the sternocleidomastoid. And it's going to be a strict motor nerve because it's going to innervate those muscles. To get to cranial nerve 12, because we have 12 cranial nerves on each side, meaning we have 24 total, we have to go back to the midline. So if you remember, here is which cranial nerve? I'll give you guys a couple seconds to remind me. Which cranial nerve is this? Okay. So this is cranial nerve 6, or the abducens nerve. Just below this nerve is cranial nerve 12, which is the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve is going to be a strict motor nerve, and it's going to innervate all of the tongue muscles. Okay, this is going to help you move your tongue. So hypoglossal nerve. All right. Okay, so what we're looking at now is a cross-sectional view or a transverse cut of the spinal cord. Okay, so imagine this long tube going up and down your entire vertebral column through the vertebral canal. But what we are doing is looking at it from a superior view, so as if we were above it. Okay, so the first thing that you should find in order to orient yourself to, to distinguish which way is the front, which way is the back, is this really big, deep groove. We call the deep groove in anatomy a fissure. So we're going to call this the anterior, because it's in the front, median, because it's right down the middle, and then fissure. So anterior, median, fissure. This is going to tell you that one, you're in the front, and two, you're right down the middle, okay? Just similar to that, but in the back side, you can't really tell on this model, but here on the black model, you can see uh, that there is still a small little groove. This is called your posterior median sulcus, or the posterior median sulcus of the spinal cord. And remember that a sulcus was a, s a small, thin groove, and a fissure was a larger, deeper groove. Okay, so make sure you understand the differences there. This is the back, this is the front. This is the front, and this is the back. Okay? Now, hopefully you guys remember the definitions of what white matter is and what gray matter is, because here's a very good, clear example of the differences in where they are. Now, a little fun fact here is that the gray matter is going to be in the middle of the spinal cord, while the white matter is going to surround the gray matter. When you get to the brain, the gray matter is mostly going to surround the white matter. So it's going to actually flip, okay? Um, so let's talk about the white matter. We're going to call the white matter columns, okay? So here we have an anterior, or we also call this ventral because ventral means front. Ventral white column. So white denoting that it's white matter, and column because these are actually tracks that ascend and descend downward. Okay, it's hard to explain here, but we'll insert a picture to help kind of visualize that. Here on the lateral aspect, there is the lateral white column, and then here towards the posterior aspect, we have the posterior white column. Okay, the posterior white column can also be called the dorsal white column because dorsal just means backside. So posterior and dorsal here are kind of used interchangeably. Now on the gray matter, we can actually call the gray matter horns because they're kind of shaped like a horn. So this would be the anterior or ventral gray horn. Okay. Over here, this would be the lateral gray horn because it's on the outside, it's towards the left and the right. So lateral gray horn, lateral gray horn over here. And then over here, we have the posterior gray horn, just like we have the posterior gray horn here. Okay, and again, posterior gray horn can also be called the dorsal gray horn, and anterior gray horns can be called the ventral gray horns. Those are used interchangeably because they are synonymous in this case. Now, um, we have to talk about the nerve rootlets and what kind of information they process. So in the front, in the anterior aspect, this is, these are going to be called your ventral rootlets. Your ventral rootlets are going to carry an efferent signal. So efferent or efferent signal starts with an E. Uh, I like to think of E for exiting. So it's coming from your central nervous system, which is made up of your brain and spinal cord, so it's originating there. And it's exiting the central nervous system to go to the periphery or to the peripheral nervous system. And it's going to innervate a muscle or a gland or something. Okay, so this is going to be carrying motor information. Whereas the dorsal aspect, these dorsal rootlets, are going to be carrying sensory information. That sensory information is called an afferent or afferent signal. 
So afferent, I like to think of arriving. So that signal is coming from the external environment and it's uh, stimulating the nerve cells that in your hand or your hair or um, the hair cells in your ear and it's going to come back to the spinal cord or the brain uh, as a efferent sensory type of signal. So it is, or afferent type of signal. So it is arriving. So E for exiting, A for arriving. So afferent signal, sensory, efferent signal, motor. From the rootlets, that actually leads us into the ventral root. So this would be the ventral root. And then back here would be the posterior or the dorsal root. And in this dorsal root, you see this large cluster, this large clump. This is called the DRG. It is known as the dorsal root ganglion. Okay, so the dorsal root ganglion is a cluster of pseudo-unipolar uh, neurons. So it's going to help interpret certain signals, okay? Once the dorsal root and the ventral root come together, they make a spinal nerve. So the spinal nerve is actually this piece together that is both this root and this root com uh, coming together. Okay, so that's the spinal nerve. Okay, and that's pretty much all you have to know about the spinal cord. That's actually a lie. We have more to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to cut that out. <laughs> okay. So, some other things that we have to talk about. This gray kind of bridge in the middle that you can kind of see here and kind of see here. This is called the gray commissure. Gray commissure. And then in the middle of the gray commissure that you can kind of see here, there is a black dot that's denoting empty space. That is called the central canal. And in that central canal is where CSF is. So you can kind of visually see that central canal on this model here. Right down the middle of the gray commissure. <laughs>